Hey everyone, Steve Miller here with an Asia Now excerpt from the September 11th, 2015 edition of Asia News Weekly. In this podcast, I speak with Catherine Moon of the Brookings Institution about the upcoming trilateral meeting between Xi, Pak, and Abe. As I mentioned last week, one of the major announcements that came out of China's victory parade was that both Xi Jinping and South Korea's President Park Geun-hye would work towards finally arranging a trilateral heads of state summit with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. While their respective foreign ministers have met before, this would mark the first time that all three had a sit-down together. To dive into this proposed summit and what it might mean for the region, I spoke with Dr. Catherine Moon, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Center for East Asia Policy Studies. I started off our conversation by asking her why now? What's changed with their relationships to generate this opportunity? Well, I don't think there's any uh, significant change um, that creates the uh, push factor. But we can look at the circumstances. Um, on the one hand, uh, Abe has been um, needing this. Uh, he needed some kind of an invitation or an olive branch from China and South Korea to engage together. So it's a it's a good thing for him if he responds positively, which he uh, seems like he will. As far as China and South Korea go, um, I think the Victory Day parade uh, not the parade itself, but the Chinese uh, newly fashioned um, three-day holiday around the celebration of the end of World War II, victory, so-called victory against Japan. I mean, most of us uh, outside and even many inside China know this is a, um, it's a, it's a ridiculous holiday, let's, let's be honest. Um, it's completely artificially made, brand new holiday out of the blue. Um, even when the Chinese Communist Party really did not do much to, um, to gain this so-called victory over the Japanese um, imperialists at the time. But what's interesting is that I think from the Chinese perspective, um, offering this olive branch toward the Japanese in particular, together with the, with the South Koreans, can be seen as a way to help soften the image of China as this um, potentially militaristic, um, aggrandizing expansionist power that uh, China has been criticized for and that many have, including the U.S., has been, um, uh, many have been very uh, wary of China um, in putting on this huge show uh, through this um, new holiday. And um, I think for China, it, it's a way to have the show and to be able to say we're also working toward peace and improve relations with our former enemy. Similarly, I think South Korea, President Park um, is riding high, especially since um, her participation in the Victory Day festivities in China. She, her public opinion polls have um, gone over 50 percent, first time in a very long time. She's been really dragging in the polls, as you know. And so for her, she has a, a positive public um, support that she can use in a way to do something that may not be so publicly um, palatable, which is to try to reach out to the Japanese. So I think that might be a good moment for her. And then when you look at Japan, Japan, especially after Prime Minister Abe's relatively lukewarm um, 70th anniversary um, uh, statement and address, lukewarm at least in, in East Asia. Um, Abe and Japan have been criticized for not really fessing up and not dealing with the war past and the history problems enough. So in a way, one could say this, if, J if Japan, Korea, China can um, hold, hold this set of talks, it would be in a way a win-win in terms of public relations for all of these countries um, because Japan would look like, yes, it uh, is trying to pass this new security legislation to actually make the self-defense forces uh, into more of a fighting force, uh, which China and South Korea don't want to see. But at the same time, Abe could say, but we're making, we're trying to make um, friends with our neighbors and we're trying to iron out the wrinkles of history, you know, um, improve relations. But, it, but is that really the case? I mean, immediately following the 
Victory Parade, both China and South Korea, really chastise Abe and Japan for their historical views. And that's been one of the hiccups in setting a bilateral meeting between Pak and Abe is, you know, the LDP, Abe's specific views on history. If China, if South Korea continue that kind of rhetoric, will that derail this trilateral talk? I don't think it would necessarily derail it. I mean, you, we can't expect um, the Chinese leadership and the South Korean leadership all of a sudden to turn around, do an about face and say, oh, Japan, we love you, and Abe, we love you. No, it's not going to happen. Um, they will do the pub internal, they'll do the public um, relations, bad mouthing of Japan for nationalistic reasons and for political reasons domestically in China and in South Korea, while at the same time uh, trying to put you know a better foot forward diplomatically. So I don't see um, a trilateral meeting and a continued um, continued, you know, rhetorical tensions over Japan's war past happening simultaneously to be a contradiction at all. The meeting is scheduled to take place, assuming it goes forward, in Seoul. And immediately following Abe's address, there was the typical protest in front of the Japanese embassy, effigies burned. Could similar problems erupt if the meeting takes place here? Or is it even significant that the meeting is taking place in Seoul? Well, I think um, it's not very significant simply because um, the trilateral meetings were held before and they've been held in Seoul as well. So it's not an it's not a out of the blue, you know, designation um, uh, in terms of locale. But um, yes, we will probably see some protesters um, in action if these trilat if this trilat meeting um, does take place. But Again, I think right now President Park uh, of South Korea is riding high on, um, on very high <laughs> um, public opinion polls for her. And so that's a plus in her favor and that's a plus in terms of um, public support for potential talks. I think the key is if we were only to see a bilateral talk happening between Japan and South Korea, yes, I think we would see much more public activism and protests in Korea against such talks or really high demands by the public toward the South Korean um, leader. But the fact that this would be a trilateral, the fact that the South Korean public is uh, feels very strongly in favor of um, improved South Korean-Chinese relations. Um, and also the fact that South Korea and China can purport to have a united front, in a sense, and look like a, that they are um, a, a larger block and that, in a way, they can sort of lord it over. It's two, to, two against one. In well, yeah, it's, it's two against one, exactly. Now, going, going back to this whole notion of a bilateral meeting, you know, that's one of the ideas is that this trilateral meeting may set the stage for a meeting between Pak and Abe. But Pak has always said that unless Japan changes its view on history, she's not going to hold that kind of meeting. And up until the dealing with North Korea with the landmine incident, you know, as you mentioned, her approval rating was around 30 percent. And now it's up to the 50 percent mark. If she moves forward with that without Japan changing their historical stance, can that meeting actually take place? Well, I don't expect uh, Mr. Abe to come up with some new formulation of his take on history, Japan's role in history in East Asia. So um, I, we're not going to see any major um, concessions on the part of the, of, of the prime minister. Um, I think it would be hard for President Park to have a head of state visit her country and not um, hold some even casual bilateral. Um, so you know, just simply out of etiquette. Um, but I think it would make it harder for her to have, you know, something official. But again, we still have time and to see what happens. And also, I think the fact that uh, the three countries have decided very quickly since the announcement of a potential trilateral to hold preparatory talks uh, very soon, next week, as a matter of fact, I think that's a good sign. They're not putting it off. 
And right now, I mean, South Korea has a lot on its plate, especially dealing with the North, um, tr making sure that the North abides by the agreement of August 25th, and also preparing for the family reunions, um, making sure that uh, keeping tabs on uh, China's visit with uh, um, Xi Jinping's visit with uh, President Obama, preparing for President Park's visit uh, with President Obama. I mean, South Korea has a lot going on and so does China. So the fact that I think they're moving pretty quickly and following up on the discussions uh, in Beijing to hold the trilateral is a, is a good sign. And we'll see what comes out of, of that and see if they lead to a path toward a bilateral. Looking forward to this trilateral meeting, what kind of agenda items would you like to see discussed? Or what do you think would be in their best interest to discuss? Well, I think uh, what I would like to see discussed uh, seems like uh, at least some of them would be on the table if uh, the trilateral go goes ahead. Um, the uh, Tokyo, Beijing, uh, and Seoul all have uh, given some signals that regional issues uh, that the countries hold in high uh, regard in common. So, for example, how to deal with the North Korean situation, a uh, nuclear issue, as well as um, provocations. Um, potential instability, um, that's definitely going to be on the agenda. Um, and also environmental issues uh, that are common to that region, air pollution, um, environmentally induced uh, pollution um, that affect, you know, Hangsa, the whole, um, the, the, uh, the, the dust storms that all of these countries and their people go through every spring, um, nuclear safety. Uh, also looking for alternative sources of energy. Um, and I think there's also interest in looking at what we would call, you know, global uh, security issues like cross-border cross spread of diseases and how to prevent them, um, risk management, et cetera. So these are all, some of them are very practical issues. The health issues in particular, I think can be and should be an area of common interest and common um, uh, planning because the region is uh, very close and there's a lot of activity back and forth. So I think uh, these practical measures would be good. Um, I would like to see, and I'm sure there would be, uh, a focus on um, improved economic uh, relations, business relations. And also, I would like to see um, some efforts uh, by all three countries' leaders at improved people-to-people -people relations. And that can mean educational exchanges, uh, not just at college level, but starting really young. Because I think one of the main problems that um, East Asia, Northeast Asia faces, if it's ever going to get over the history problem, um, is that you need to have not just one country and one society, so-called the Japanese public and the Japanese government, transform its understanding uh, of Japan's role in World War II, um, but you need to have all of these countries, all of the Northeast Asian and some Southeast Asian countries go through a re-education um, away from nationalism, away from constant um, accusations and um, uh, uh, sort of this um, victimization of one another and this demonization of one another that stem from the uh, legacies of, of colonialism in World War II. All of the Asian countries that experience the atrocities and the problems and pains, they need to go through a lot of soul searching and you need to start that very young. Um, you can't change people's mindsets, hearts, mentalities, um, unless you start very, very young. And so I think people to people exchange, cultural exchanges um, are something that I would like also to see. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, one last question. There's a lot that needs to be discussed at these meetings. And in your opinion, does this trilateral meeting set the stage for improved regional relationships or is this merely something that these three heads of state are doing just because it's a necessity? Well, of course, they all have something in it for their, in terms of their personal political gains to do it as leaders. Um, Abe needs it very badly because he's been criticized in his own country um, for not doing enough uh, in terms of improving relations with China and South Korea. 
and if anything, uh, making relations worse um, under his t during his tenure. But I think um, apart from the optics of all this, which are always, they're inherent to these kinds of meetings, um, China, South Korea, and Japan, they need to meet. They need to meet regularly as they used to because economic problems um, in the region and in these three countries are very closely tied together. And also potential economic salvation is also closely tied together. So they need to cooperate on that level. Environmental issues, no one country there can do it alone. Um, and even on history issues, they really need to look at history and the past collectively. Um, and I think you need to sit down to do that. So I would hope, and it's possible also, that once you have a trilateral take place, that then allows for uh, a certain momentum. So even if it's mainly optics in the initial stage, the fact that there will be some um, uh, pressure for deliverables and that those deliverables then have to be um, uh, implemented, have to be in a way massaged, um, all these things will call for, will require continued attention to trilateral relations continuously improving. So I think um, just getting it started would uh, be a, a, a very significant um, event. Uh, Dr. Catherine Moon is the Senior Fellow at the Brookings Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thanks. It was fun. Now, before I go, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this upcoming trilateral summit. What are your predictions for it? Will it foster greater ties, or will it simply be a massive photo opportunity with little to show for its efforts? This episode of Asia Now features extended content of material originally broadcast as part of the Asian News Weekly podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is free, and when you do, the next episode is delivered automatically to you. You can subscribe on our website, asianewsweekly.net, or in your favorite podcast application. You can also keep up with more news from the region by following Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please drop us an email message. That address is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, remember to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.